Good day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Colour Cave. My name's Gem and I like to play with art stuff. I am moderately hungover today and as you can see I have caught a lot of sun. I was partying in the sunshine yesterday at our local agricultural show which is always great fun but it usually involves a fair amount of beer and I'm definitely getting too old for this. Today's video is all about mediums that we can use in backgrounds for our drawings and our colouring pages. I did consider putting this video under the colouring for beginners set of videos that I've been working on. However, I think even seasoned colourists and artists haven't necessarily explored all of the avenues when it comes to backgrounds. And I just wanted to have a quick run through today of some of the things that I use, uh, not only for my drawings, but for my colouring pages as well and I'm hoping that one or two of you might pick up on something that you've not used before and give it a shot. So hope you enjoy, let's get going! Here is a picture that I'd started to draw. It was actually a, a bit of a test run before I drew a final sketch. So I didn't complete the picture, but when I do that, I always keep whatever I've drawn. I never, you know, erase it or throw it in the bin. I keep, I keep everything because you never know when it comes in handy. And today is one of those days. So in order to demonstrate to you the different types of mediums, I've split the background up into six different sections and I have six mediums to show you. I'll go into a little bit of detail with each one just to show you the properties of each and it might help you make a decision on things that you might want to try or if you're just trying to pick a, a particular texture or medium for an image that you're drawing or an image that you're colouring. So what I have for you here, first of all, I have good old fashioned pencils. And what I have here are two polychromos pencils. This is just standard sketch paper. I would probably have been better using mixed media paper to show you this. And the paper can have a huge impact on how the, the medium itself turns out. But just for sort of general purpose and the fact that I'd already drawn this picture, that's why I'm using this paper. So I have ordinary coloured pencils, watercolour pencils, pastel pencils, gelatos, which we'll go into a bit more detail about in due course. Standard watercolours, these are pan watercolours and traditional chalk pastels or soft pastels. So we're going to go through them one by one and we're just going to have a little bit of a look at each of them and see how they go down and the different things that you can do with them. So I'm going to start with the most simple thing and the most straightforward thing and that is coloured pencils. Whether you have a graphite drawing or whether you have a page in a colouring book, pencils are usually the most readily available thing that you'll have in your stash. So it made sense to start with these. When using coloured pencils for backgrounds, the, the two main types of backgrounds that you're going to be looking at are ones with big wide open spaces like this and ones where there are more intricate and tighter spaces to get into. And that's one of the main factors that's probably going to help you decide which medium you're going to choose. Now with coloured pencils, if you're going to do a background of any description, the best way to do it is to do it very, very lightly with very light pressure and build up layers because that's going to give you a much more uniform colour and general gradient if that's what you're wanting to put in than if you go in heavy handed. So I'm just going to start demonstrating here. Generally when using coloured pencils I wouldn't recommend them for large areas unless you have endless amounts of patience which I do not because it is very time consuming. So as I would do with anything else, I just start with a very, very light pressure and in these little circular motions, start to build up a base layer, if you like. Just fill in as much as I can. Now, everybody is probably already aware, pencil is one of the slowest mediums you can use when it comes to art full stop. It does take time, it does take patience, and it's one of those ones where if you persevere with it, the payoff is usually worth it. Now, I could go into different brands of pencils and their, how hard the cores are and that kind of thing. But I really think that that could be another video all on its own. And I'm sure it's been explored a million times over on YouTube by other YouTubers. 
really what I'm trying to do here is just give you the comparison so that you can see side by side all the different mediums and the type of effect that you're going to get. Now the nice thing about pencil is you can choose when to stop. You can have a very 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 pale background if you just want a hint of colour and I find this particularly useful when I have done a graphite drawing because I don't want the background to overpower what the, what the actual subject matter is. I find that having the control of the pencil and being able to decide you know how many layers is enough uh, I find that advantageous and again I mentioned it before but I am a person that likes the, the texture of pencil and that's one of the things that I really like about it because it adds an interest to your background without taking over whatever it is you've got in your foreground. So there we go, I'm just going to start going back over here. This was going to take me a little while so while I'm doing this I just wanted to chat a little bit about backgrounds because it's something that I see mentioned a lot and people get really hung up on backgrounds. If you have a central image and you're just looking to fill in, you know, what's going on round about, then a, a plain gradient background or even just one colour is perfect because the point of a background is that it's going to enhance whatever it is the subject matter is. And I see people getting really hung up on, oh, my background's not perfect. Oh, I've done this wrong. I've messed it up. And really, I think that people pay far too much attention to it. If your background is coming under close scrutiny by the viewer of your piece of art or your piece of colouring, you're colouring or drawing wrong because the focus should not be on that background. The focus should be on the subject matter. So unless the background is the focal point of your piece, then there should be absolutely, you know, no disasters. Unless you've like smudged it all out or something like that, that that's different. But generally speaking, it's it's not such a big deal and I don't know why people make a big deal of it. I really don't. So I'm just building up some layers of, of, the, of the different colours now. I have picked these pencils for a reason. I have a very limited palette of the pastel pencils and I wanted to show you the three different types of pencils side by side. So I figured using the same colours would be good. So that was why I picked these colours. I wouldn't even say that they go particularly well together, but... You know, what can you do? I'm starting to get some sort of decent base. And one of the advantages of using any type of pencil, whether it's watercolour, traditional or otherwise, is that when you have little tight spaces, you have the precision because you have a point on your pencil and you can get right in there with a reasonable amount of accuracy. Whereas sometimes when you're using things like soft pastels, i.e. pastel chalks, it's not always as easy to get in there and you don't, although you are able to erase it, it's just not as, you know, it's not quite as straightforward. It's still, it can still be done, but it's a certainly a lot easier when you've got some pencil, especially when you're using really light layers. You can erase any little mistakes that you've made without too much hassle. So now you can see that the layers are starting to come through a little bit more and you can still see especially in this light you can still see quite a lot of texture under there and I think that unless you are endlessly patient then you are going to have some sort of texture in your your pencil work that's going to happen it is possible to get a really smooth lovely background um there is a lady in one of the colouring groups that I belong to and I have spoken about her before I think and she her backgrounds are amazing and she 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 uses predominantly pencil but she spends hours and hours and hours on her on her backgrounds uh personally I just I, I just don't have as much patience for things like that I'm afraid as I say I'm usually more interested in what's going on in the foreground all right so I'm just going to start to blend in this paler green to my darker green and I'm just doing this the same way I would do a gradient with anything else it's it's no different from the way you would normally do a, a standard pencil gradient there are various methods and ways of doing it and there is no right or wrong way definitely um and again that's something I get asked a lot is oh what you know what's the what's the best way to do a gradient some people go from light to dark, some people 
go the other way around and some people like me do a mixture uh, I tend to sort of sit back and use my eye as much as possible and just just adjust accordingly and I tend to find that that's just the best way to do things okay so now that I've got a decent base layer down I'm going in a bit heavier with my pencil I'm you probably I would say medium pressure for me anyway and I'm going to start to really build up the pigment now and this is what I'm saying if you look at this part compared to this part I could leave it that pale if that's what I wanted to do but I can sit here and build this up as much as I like oh there's little dog flapping her ears hello wee dog and make it as vibrant as I want and that is the beauty of coloured pencil the other thing that you can do with pencil if you're wanting a, a smoother background and maybe pencil is all you have is you can do this and build up the layers and get the, the desired saturation of the colours that you want and you can go over it with a blender. You can either use a blending pencil or you can use something like odourless mineral spirits or pencil blending medium. The one that, that I use that you get here in the UK is called Zest It and it's made from, well it's, it's not made from oranges but it has orange oil in it and it smells absolutely fabulous. So you can use something like that if you if you want to you know try and really get a smooth 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 background. If you're looking for that smoothness in your background though I would suggest that pencil is probably not, not the best way to go. So you can start to appreciate now that the amount of time and effort that goes in to making a, a pencil background in a large area like this, a large open space. I say generally, I don't think it's favourable. By the time you've spent time sketching or colouring in your, your main image, really you don't want to be spending a huge amount of time on your background. Or maybe that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> that might just be me. I'm not a particularly patient person when it comes to things like that. You can see that's given a reasonable gradient and that's the type of texture you can expect from your pencil. But when I zoom in on this, and this is where the criticism of people's own work comes, you can see the texture of the pencil and you can see the tooth of the paper. That is going to happen. Unless you want to blend it out, that is what happens when you use pencils for a background. The advantages of using pencil, aside from being able to get into really tight spaces, you usually have a much broader selection of colours from the get-go. Obviously, you can mix colours with most of the mediums that are available, but usually you have ready-made, I can pick, you know, one of three or four colours of green and so on and so forth. So it does have its advantages. Moving on now, I'm going to show you the watercolour pencil. So as a pencil, these behave in very much the same way as your normal pencils and you can use them in the same manner and you still have the same control over them as you do your coloured pencils. So again you're just going to do the same thing again with these and you don't have to be as particular with the watercolour pencils because you're going to activate them with water which is going to change how it sits on the paper anyway. But as a general rule of thumb, I will start off the same way as I would with a normal pencil. I think just because that's what I'm used to. Perhaps watercolour artists, and if anybody is a watercolour artist, you can certainly let me know in the comments below. But as someone who is a, a self-confessed pencil monster, and that is the, the medium that I am comfortable with, I would, I would use the watercolour pencil initially the same way as I would uh, a normal pencil. Again, just very, very light pressure and I'm going to start to, to get some sort of gradient. And again, the wonderful thing about your watercolour pencils is that when you activate it with water, you can smooth out that gradient until your little heart is content. Until obviously your, your paper has reached saturation point and it's, it's all soggy. Oh dear. I like watercolour pencils because they're very versatile and you can you can chop and change with them and you can leave areas just as dry pencil if that's what you desire and you can switch over and get your get your water out to make something a little bit more exciting in other areas. So you can have you've got the beauty of the pencil and the watercolour in the one area without having to to chop and change. Now what I'm going to show you here is on this side here I'm going to do some really dark lines like this and then 
along this side, I'm just going to fill this out a bit more like I would with a normal pencil. And again, this is really just to make sure there's plenty of pigment down on the paper so that when I do activate it with water, it, you know, there's there's quite a good, quite a good bit of colour pops out. So if you do leave it as a very pale layer, which I will do with the lighter pencil up here, it will give you a really delicate wash. And again, if you have a a, a more delicate picture that you that you know that you actually have in your foreground, then that might just be the ticket for you. You know, that might just be what you're looking for. But again, the best thing to do is experiment with these. Have a play about with them. Don't just go straight into an image because you need to go through, as with any art supply really, you need to go through that sort of discovery stage first and find out what you like and what you don't like before actually jumping into something that you've spent a lot of time colouring or drawing. Okay. Now when you're activating these watercolour pencils, it's entirely up to you which way you do it. You can use a traditional brush, just dipped in a pot of water, or you can become a fangirl like me and get yourself some Zig water brushes. There are other water brushes available on the market, but as everyone knows by now, these are my favourite. So you can see between the normal pencil and the watercolour pencil, there's not a huge amount of difference in saturation. Apart from this little corner here, I've laid down a similar amount of pigment onto the paper. Here we go on the back of my hand as usual. And if I just start, now this is a wide brush. If I just start sweeping this across, squeeze a bit of water down. You can see how much the color jumps out straight away. And I can just bring that out into my lighter area like this. And it really helps to smooth out the colour. So you're not going to get the graininess that you've got down here if you haven't used a blender pencil. It is going to be much smoother. And if you time your strokes and let them dry a little in between, you can get a nice effect with your brush as well. And again, that is something to play about with. Now you see here, if I go over the big dark streaks that I've done, you can actually leave behind some of that and what that does is just gives you a bit of texture should you desire it as well. So watercolour pencils are great because they're really, really versatile. And you can go back in here where the where the, the changeover is, you know, from your dark to your light colour, where that gradient is, you can go back in there and you can mess about with it and you can smooth it out with a great deal of ease. And it's going to give you some really, really nice effects. So there you go. That is your watercolour pencil. The one thing I will say is if you're going to use watercolour pencils in a colouring book, as opposed to if you've drawn your own image, you need to be careful because the paper will buckle unless it is watercolour paper. You can see mine starting to ripple here and that will affect what goes on in the back. There's the finished image. <laughs> oh. So you can see there where I've put the water on and it has buckled the page. I didn't use a huge amount of water there, but it is very dependent on the paper. So I would test it in an area of a colouring book at the back before you jump in and do that. The other thing that you can do is if you've done a whole, you know, if I was to do this whole background in watercolour, what I would be tempted to do is let it dry and then cover the image up and place a lot of heavy books on top of it and let it sit for a day or two because that can help even out your paper again. It's never going to go back to being perfectly flat um, but it, it can improve it considerably especially if there's an image on the other side that you want to colour in. If you're drawing I would recommend using mixed media paper or I would use watercolour paper if you're going to put some colour into your, your artwork using using watercolour as well, whether it's traditional watercolour or watercolour pencils, because the paper will just cope with it much, much better. These are the Faber-Castell Pit Pastel Pencils. <laughs> and um, again, it's, it's actually just coincidence. I, I don't intentionally buy Faber-Castell over any other brand, but I just happen to have the watercolour pencils, the standard pencils as well. So I've managed to get the same colours again. I am, 
I'm a bit of a, the jury's a bit out on these for me. I'm not a huge pastel fan anyway. I do prefer these marginally over the, the soft pastel blocks and it's just because they're less messy. However, the same applies with these as does with your traditional pencils. They're not great for huge areas of background. The watercolour pencils are because you can sort of squish it out as much as you like. But these, are, I would say, are better for little tight spaces or small areas of background that you're looking to get a, a sort of nice coverage on. And the first thing you notice about these is they, they don't feel like normal pencils. I would be worried if they did right enough. And you have to experiment greatly with pressure do not press really hard with these because all you'll do is mash down the tooth of the paper and damage it and then when it comes to manipulating the pastel which is the the main plus point of pastel uh, you will have a much harder time doing it because everything will be stuck down in the tooth of your paper now i am i am just kissing this paper i am not putting any amount of pressure on it at all and you can see how much colour is going down on the paper. It's fabulous. This is particularly good if anybody suffers with rheumatism or you know any other sort of joint issues. The, these are absolutely fabulous for covering backgrounds because you really don't have to press hard at all. Now there, you can gradate in, in different ways with these pencils. I'm going to show you probably the messiest way. <laughs> and again, the, the, the beautiful thing about pastels being in a pencil form like this is it's really easy to go back over and tweak certain areas if you find you've got an area that's a lot lighter than the rest of it you can just go in and again you've got that precision to go in with the point of your pencil and just add in a tiny little bit more pigment and you can start to balance things out so there's lots of ways that you can smooth this out again you can see a lot of white of the paper the first thing that's always readily available is a cotton bud, or if you live in America, a Q-tip. A bit like using a blending stump, you can just start little circular motions. I would say pressing medium pressure, but you can see how much that's smoothed out straight away. You don't want to press too hard because, again, you don't want to mash down the tooth of the paper until you're absolutely certain that you're finished. And here we come up to the gradient part. And again, I'm just like little circular motions. Now, by using a cotton bud, it gives you a little bit of precision in what you're doing. So you, although you're not going to get into the nitty gritty the way you can with the point of your pencil, you can still get into reasonably tight spaces. So there you go. That's like, you know, even just on a first coat there, not being someone who is fixated on having perfectly, absolutely, you know, smooth as butter backgrounds, I would be quite happy with something like that floating about in the background. <laughs> floating about in the background. I would be quite happy with that as a background. But if I wanted it to be a little bit more intense, all I have to do is, and I'm just using the same light pressure as I was using before, is just come back in here with my pencil and just put another layer on like this. Really straightforward, absolutely no hassle. The other thing I want to do is just improve my gradient a little bit here as well. So I'm just going to bring this lighter green down into my dark green and then I'll build up a little bit more up here. You don't have to take too much care here. You really don't. There we go. And I can work in this central section now and I can start working across the way and really blending those two greens in to one another. Really start smooshing them together to give me a bit of a smoother transition between the two colours. And I'm just going to use the other end because I'm going down into the dark part again. And I can just go like this. There we go. See that that was quick. And I've actually got more saturation here than I have with my pencil which is absolutely fab. The other good thing about this as well is now, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so that I can show you. I've made a bit of an oopsie. I've got a little bit of a mark in there. The great thing about soft pastels is you can erase them. So I'm just taking my little Derwent eraser and it's gone. 
it is literally gone just like that. So it's very forgiving in that sense. So if you are working in more intricate areas and you you just don't quite make it and you you know you go over your lines, you can fix it really easily. And right in at this corner here, I can just go back over that with my cotton bud again. And just pull some of the, the pastel into that little corner to make it look a bit better. So on this paper, just while we're zoomed in like this, you can see the difference between how these three mediums alone are sitting on the paper. You have got a much smoother background with two layers of pastel pencil than you do with several layers of normal pencil. Now, you, I would personally spend more time building this up, but see, I'm, I don't want this video to be about three days long, so. And you can see there, the watercolour, that's starting to dry now. So you can create different textures with this depending on your brush. You can also build up layers. If you're using watercolour paper, you could build up layer upon layer and get that really deep and vibrant. And the pastel pencils have done a fabulous job there in a really short space of time. And you have the, the added advantage of being able to erase quite, quite quickly. And depending on your paper, it should take a couple of layers. So again, you can build up that really deep, rich colour. So I'm just going to go a little bit further with this and see if I can get this paper. I see this paper is not designed for this, but I'm just wanting to see if it's going to take any more of the pigment. And I can feel underneath my pencil and you can see the way that it's going down now that it's it's starting to reject any more pigment. Um, but that is purely down to the fact that this is just bog standard sketch paper. It's not not really designed truly for, for pastel pencil. But as you can see, I've still got a reasonably good result with that without, you know, too much effort. So I'm just lightening up here. The way I, again, the way I would do a gradient normally when I'm using a, a normal pencil, be it graphite or otherwise. Give it some welly with my, with my lighter green. And again, because I can erase, I'm not being too careful here. I'm just like, yes, yeah, slap it down. It's fabulous. We love it. If there's anything I can do to make things easier for myself, you can be sure that I will do it. Okay, again, I'm still on the same cotton bud as before. I'm not even bothering to change it because I don't need to. And just rub that in. And you can see how quickly that smooths out as well, even though my pencil lines were quite harsh there. I'm just going to go little circular motions all the way around. And my transition between my greens now, I'm really happy with. It's really gradual. There we go. Look at that. Ta-da! All right, so moving on to our traditional pastels. Uh, you can see here I have a, a little set. Well, it's, it's actually quite a big set, but they're, they're little pastels. They're just baby chalks. Now, obviously, using using block pastels like this, the, the way that you transfer it onto the paper is the main difference. And this is where there can be a lot of variation. There's different ways of doing it. If I'm working in a small space, I would do the 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 old uh, cotton bud trick and I would take my pastel now I'm not going to do it over the paper because it's going to go everywhere this is the downside to block pastels like this they are they, they're dusty they're messy um so just be aware of that also if you have any respiratory problems I would probably avoid these this is very turquoisey we're just going to go for it anyway because I don't think I've got anything closer than that so if I'm working in an intricate space like I'm going to do here, I would use my, my cotton bud and again, little circular motions, just start to work in and basically just really lightly push the pastel into the paper. If you use too heavy a hand, you do tend to get quite a blotchy effect and sometimes, again, depending on the paper, that can be quite difficult to rectify. But a little of this goes a long way and you can pick up the dust from elsewhere. And again, I just need to zoom in to show you how dusty this is. You can see all the little specks, they're going absolutely everywhere. This is why I'm not that keen on pastel because if you're not particularly careful like me, it can leave you with a lot of cleaning up to do afterwards. And apparently you're not supposed to blow the dust off because it goes everywhere. So yeah, make make... make. Take from that what you will. The other way that you can let your pastel down onto the paper, and I learned this from the 
oracle that is Pita Hewitt. If you haven't watched any of her videos, I strongly urge you to go and do it. She has some fantastic YouTube videos. The Yeah, the other way to do this is you can take a craft knife. I've just got a little baby one. And you can actually scrape the dust onto your paper, like so. And then you can take your cotton bud and you can just start to manipulate it until most of that dust has disappeared. Now again, I would say this is probably easier than using the cotton bud in the previous method, you know, taking it straight off the stick, but it is messier. <laughs> but if you like, if you like really getting your hands dirty and really getting into what you're doing, then by all means. The other thing to be really wary of when you're using pastels is where you're putting your great big dirty fingers. <laughs> you can see mine are filthy already. I'm trying really hard to keep this hand, my right hand, away from the paper so that I don't leave a, a, a turquoise thumbprint anywhere. Okay, I'm just gonna dust this off. Right, so there you are next to your pastel pen so you can see the difference. That is just one coat. So it's just exactly the same principle. You can build up the colour layer by layer. If I go back in here. And again, being pastel, you don't have to be too careful about your edges because you can go back and erase anywhere where you, you've gone into a section that you, you don't want the pastel to be in. It's really straightforward that way. And again, that is one of the really nice things about pastels. So I'm just up into my, my gradient now. There we go. Now I'm going to go back to this method again. So down the side, just scrape a little bit on. I have heard that, I haven't used them myself, but I've heard that the, the mung, a mungyo or mungyo pastels, the, you can get them on Amazon and they're really reasonably priced and I have heard nothing but good things about them. So it's not an expensive medium to try out if you're new to it. You know, you don't have to break the bank to, to have a go, so to speak. Okay, so we're getting somewhere now. I will say that using the block pastels, if you're wanting to cover large areas of background, they are super for that and I'm just about to show you why saturation versus effort the block pastels are sort of instantly gratifying it's quite good if you have a large area to cover you can get yourself a bit of cotton wool again i learned from peter hewitt so i use these little cotton pads but you can use the cotton wool balls or anything like that it's entirely up to yourself and you can do one of two things you can do what we did before and you can take the color straight off the block or you can scrape onto the paper like we did with this paler colour. So I'm just going to do that up here. And you can scrape on. And again, I would say less is more. Start with a little and if you feel it's not enough, you can always go back and scrape on more. Um, I fold mine in half, sometimes in a quarter, and use this sort of, this edge here. And you can go to town and you can just swirl it round and squidge it about. And this lets you cover large areas really, really quickly. Like super quick. So I'm just taking care to make sure that I'm putting the cotton wool down on the actual dust that I've put on the page and then I'm just manipulating it and moving it around and as I'm moving it around it's sticking in the tooth of the paper. So there you go, that is how quickly you can cover an area if you use the cotton wool method. It's really, really good, it's really quick and you still have all the good pastel properties like being able to erase parts that you don't want like down here and it will take it off absolutely no problem so that is your block pastel and it can take you time to build up layers after you've finished with this and i would say the same with the pastel pencils the disadvantage here is that they will transfer so if you are if you are finished with your image and you've got your pastel down, but only when you're totally finished, you need to spray it with some sort of fixative and that'll stop it transferring over either onto other colouring pages or if you've got your artwork in a 
in a folder or a binder or some sort of portfolio it will stop the dust sticking to the plastic or worse the back of the the next piece of artwork you have that's quite important that you do that this is the fixative that I use and simply because I can pick this up locally I have an art supply store not too far from me and this is what they stock I have never had any problems with it it's reasonably expensive but this is a workable fixative so what that means is once you've sprayed it over it'll stop your pastel moving about but you can then go and work over the top of that with pencil or ink or whatever and it's not going to affect what's underneath but still the pastel will stay put on the paper it is fixed to the paper as the name suggests there are loads of them on the market um make sure you get a matte fixative if you get a gloss one it, unless you want a shiny finish right enough you, you're better off with this because it'll it will keep the true color of what you've done as well all right, so the next thing we are looking at is our traditional watercolour. Just going to use a water brush to do this. You don't have to, you can use a normal paintbrush. You can pick a paintbrush up really cheap. And for the purposes of doing a background, you don't need an expensive brush. The main advantage of using pan watercolour, or I would call it proper watercolour is the it's the effects and the washes that you can get and it's one of those things you just need to play about with it and find out what you like but you can really vary the depth of the colour and how much you want to lay down and that is the beauty of watercolour and it certainly won't overpower your main image if you don't want it to so you can see here, I've used plenty of water. I was probably a bit brave of me considering the paper's not really meant for it. But I just wanted to show you how much I can pull out this colour. I can keep pulling that out and pulling it down. And I can use a round brush and it, it wouldn't leave a square edge like this. But as long as it's still wet, you can manipulate it so much. And you can literally keep painting it down until it comes out to nothing. And again, that's a really nice delicate effect for you to have in a background picture. If you just want something simple that's going to make your image stand out. And for example, I'm just, give me a wee second, I'm just going to keep going with this. If this was a really bright colour, I probably wouldn't want a really bright colour tucked in behind it because it's going to detract from the main image. So a, a, a really pale wash gradient like this would be absolutely perfect. But again, if I decide, well, do you know what? I'm really not happy with that. That's, that's not really doing what I want it to do. Then I can go and pick another colour and do the same sort of idea that I've done already. And the concentration of the paint to the water can be altered greatly. And that lets you control how much of the how vibrant you want the color to be or what you know what you want to do with it kind of thing so i mean you could go on forever and again as long as the paper's quite wet then you've got that advantage of being able to manipulate it and push it about uh, this is entirely the wrong brush for going into tiny spaces if you have a smaller paintbrush you can get into all your little nooks and crannies without too much hassle. And I would strongly suggest sticking to mixed media paper for this. Your colouring books probably won't thank you too much for destroying them with this much water because I've used quite a lot of water. There is a really good video on YouTube by a young lady called Hello Alice and she is a she's an excellent artist and she she it's art videos that she does but she has a watercolor for beginners um video where she looks at different types of washes and things that you can do i'll put a link in the description to that actually along with links for peter's videos as well and you know she'll do she does a much better job of things like this than i do but again advantages of watercolor is that you can cover a large area however you do have to watch your paper and you can manipulate it and just like with the watercolor pencils you can leave certain areas so that they they stand out and just give your background a little bit of texture if that's what you want Okay, last and certainly not least, I have the Faber-Castell Gelatos. I don't have a huge amount of colours, so I've just picked these two because they, they go well together. These are quite unique in that they, they're basically just crayons. That's the only way I can describe them. They're like a lipstick and you twist them up from the bottom 
and you can draw with them. I'll just show you down here. You know, you can you can draw lines and things with them and, you know, do all that kind of bit if that's what you, you want to do. So you do have a little bit of precision with them and you can work away there. But they are also very easy, easily manipulated. The best way for a background is either to use your finger or a sponge. I've just realised I haven't lifted a sponge. But just put it onto your finger and you can start squishing it into the paper. And you can press as hard as you like, it doesn't really matter. I haven't found it has made any difference. So, and again, it lets you cover a reasonable area quite quickly. But the thing I like about these is how smooth it comes out. For those on the quest for a perfect smooth background, I would say that the gelatos for me are the way forward. They 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 seem to be quite forgiving and I find them a lot easier to control than the likes of the the, the pastel chalk sticks. And the paper just seems and I, I've yet to come across paper that doesn't like gelatos. <laughs> I really I haven't. But you can, I mean, you and you can go forever with this. It hardly uses any of the actual sticks. So these sticks last forever. And you can rub away and rub away and keep going and just squish them in. And they're really, really easy to blend as well. I'm going to use another finger here. This is me onto the a pale blue colour. And I'm just going to start. Oh, that might be too pale for you to see. Oh, no, you can still see that. That's good. And I can squish away quite the thing. And this really like you know that this is like the 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 waywards the wayward artist's best friend. So maybe that's why I like them so much. It's like yeehaw, let's go, let's just chuck it all down and make something pretty. So again, you can see it's not taken me long to cover this area. Although this paler color does take a little bit more work, I have to say. But oh, it's the least of my problems just now. I think. <laughs> Here we go. They are quite expensive. I've had mine for ages, so I can't even tell you. I can't remember how much I paid for them. But I think I, I think I bought a set of 12 originally, and I think they cost me about £20. So they're not the cheapest of of things to, to be using. But as I say, they do last forever, and they are so forgiving. So you, and again, that's one of those things you can work away for ages and ages until you've got the desi the desired depth and saturation that you want for your picture. But that's you saw how quick that was as well, so that was really handy. Yeah. So the other thing about gelatos as well is the and that they're quite forgiving, as you can actually erase them as well. So you can see I've gone over little Yoshi's shoe here, and all I'm doing again is taking my little electric eraser because it's super handy, and I'm just taking it off. And it just comes off and that's it. So, you know, what's not to like about them apart from the price? I do his fingers as well while I'm here. And the gelatos, because it is that sort of funny medium, you would be better spraying that with fixative when you're finished as well. It, when you touch it, it, it feels almost, I want to say tacky. Tacky is the wrong word, but you can definitely feel that it's sitting on the surface of the paper. So I would be tempted to spray that with fixative. To be fair, I spray all of my pictures, my finished images, um, regardless of whether it's something that I've drawn or something I've coloured, I do spray all my images with fixative because I want everything to stay right where it is. But if you're a person that doesn't normally do it, if you're going to use pastels or the gelatos, I would suggest it. I would recommend it. So there you go. That is a, a very brief introduction to six different types of uh, media that you can use for backgrounds and some of the things that are good and bad about each of them. So I hope that has been of interest to you and that you have either learned something or it's maybe spurred you on to go and try a different type of medium than you'd normally go for. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please take a moment to give us a thumbs up. We're still a very small channel. Oh, look at that. Very small channel and thumbs up are always good at this point. If you like what you see, then you can always subscribe if you haven't already. I do put out two videos a week and I tend to balance them between drawing things and colouring things and mutually beneficial things. So there's something for everyone. And as I say, one of those videos goes out on a Monday and a Friday. So you've got two times the fun every week. Thanks again for watching, guys. And we'll see you next time in the Colour Cave. Bye bye.